All right, I have two minutes past the hour, so I think we'll go ahead and get started for this morning. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today for the MIT Concrete Sustainability Hub public webinar. Uh, we have a special guest presenter today, uh, Dr. Jason Weiss from Oregon State University. Uh, will be our presenter. As a reminder, uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A function and the questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Uh, the presentation uh, topic today is the role of air entrainment in freeze thaw and corrosion-based service life models for performance. Uh, and Jason, if you're all set, take it away. Good morning. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining in this morning. And what I'd like to do, as mentioned, uh, I'd like to start off by thanking MIT for the opportunity to per present this uh, session as a part of their, uh, their CSH Hub series. And I'd also like to talk a little bit about the role, uh, the role of air entrainment. Uh, and it, the role of air entrainment, I'm really going to talk about two main areas where air entrainment uh, can play a major role and where I think we're making some major advancements on learning what the air is doing. The first of these is really looking at the freeze-thaw performance of the concrete, which is really why the air is there. And the second is really looking at the role that air has in, in transport and specifically how this plays into the corrosion process and a lot of the calculations uh, that are currently being done for service life. I think that this is a, an, under, um, an, under, um, an understudied area that I think we uh, could, could learn a lot more about and it could actually tell us a lot more about how our concrete is performing and could give us a lot of insights into some of the variability uh, that we're seeing in the field. So the first thing that I would say is, you know, when we look at a concrete, we'll see a, a batch ticket, a daily batch ticket that shows up, and it looks something like this. And we see that air has been added. Um, and typically when we see air being added, this is actually a chemical admixture that's being added that's going to stabilize air bubbles as they're created during the mixing process. But the basic idea is we're going to get a certain percentage of air, and many of our specifications are looking to get four, five, or six uh, percent air in the overall fresh concrete. And the question is really, why is the air in there? What's the air doing? And why do we, what benefits do we get from the air inside of the system? Well, if we just do a quick survey and we, we uh, look at what people say, the whole idea behind the air entrainment is really to create billions of little tiny bubbles, all right? The bubbles are there to relieve some of the pressure that forms uh, when ice starts to form inside of the system, and it's mainly because the ice is actually, uh, it's expanding and it's drawing water out of the smaller pores, and in doing both of those, you're creating a pressure as well as creating an osmotic pressure. So the basic idea here is the freezing process itself creates a hydraulic pressure, an osmotic pressure, as well as water movement uh, in the system to move from the smaller pores to the larger pores where the, air, where the ice is going to be forming. Generally, air is about 4 to 7 percent of the overall concrete volume. And as we see here, this is what we typically measure. But really what we're worried about is we're worried about how much of that is in the paste. So we're going to talk about this a little bit more as we go. But what I'd really like to say is while this is typically what we hear about air entrainment, and this is a good starting point, this really isn't the whole story of what air is doing inside of the system. And for that, we want to take a, a little bit of a step uh, back and look at our mixture proportions again and really start to bring all of this uh, together. If we take a second and we look at our mixture proportions, we can really start to do a, a plot that would really make some, a group like the, the USA Today proud where we essentially have one of these pie charts where we could essentially say, that we have a plot of the percentages of the materials that are being used, and the plot that we see here is typically done by weight or mass. And the reason that we typically see our mixture proportions in weight or mass is because this is typically how they're batched uh, by the ready mix producer. This is how our mill, uh, our, our, uh, our ticket, our concrete ticket comes out. And what we see, not surprisingly, is that we have about 80% of the system in a paving concrete being made up of aggregates. We then have about 13% being the cement, or maybe it's cementitious materials, and a relatively small amount of the system being water. Uh, in this particular case, it's a 6% water system. We'll notice that the air is insignificant when we start to look at, at masses here, because again, it's a chemical admixture, um, and it's going to be very small in the overall system. And while this is very important for proportioning, and while, and while this is very important for batching the concrete, 
what we really notice that's really the key issue is the specific gravities of cement and aggregates are substantially different than water, and in that, in that case, they're substantially different than air. So when we convert from a system that, that breaks things up based on just mass to a system that starts to look at things in terms of volume, we see that the proportions can change slightly. So the aggregates are still going to be a large portion of the overall system. However, what we started to see in the paste is the volume of water is taking up a much larger portion of our concrete. And this is really due to the difference in density of the materials. So a little bit of water can have a major impact on what's happening in our overall concrete system. Now, if we look at this even a little bit closer, we may have something that's at like 6% air that's being inside of the system. And what's really important about this is while it may be 6% of the air that's in the total concrete, if we just looked at the cement, the water, and the air, which could be part of our paste system, we'll see that the percentage of, of air inside of the paste is more like 20% of the overall system. Right, I, typically a good rule of thumb is that we want to be around 18 to 20 percent of the system. Now, why is there a distinction here and why is this important? Well, the air is really there to protect the paste portion of the system. So we really want to have that 18 percent of the, uh, the paste being these air voids to really protect the paste. So what we'll notice is in mixtures that have a higher paste content, we will typically see that we want to have a slightly higher air content as we can make the mixtures leaner and leaner and we can take paste out of the mixtures, we can typically reduce the overall uh, air content in the concrete volume. Now what I want to do is I want to take a step further and I want to try to make the transition from this unreacted material where we just have a volume of cement and we have a volume of water and I want to start to look at what happens when that system starts to react. So if we start to look at simulating what happens in the paste as the system reacts, what we can see is that we've started out, right, and we're starting out here not at 0% hydration, 0% would be way back over here, right, and we essentially start out with a particular amount of water in the system, right, so our water is going to be on the top and it's going to be this bluish color, and then we have a certain amount of cement in the system, which are going to be these grays and these darker colors. Now, as the cement starts to react with the water, what we'll notice is these darker colors, the blacks and the grays are right here, which are really all of our raw components of our cement, these are going to react and they're going to be consumed and they're going to essentially be decreasing as the degree of hydration increases. In addition, we're going to see that the amount of water here, which is shown as the dark blue, that's going to decrease as the system hydrates. Now what's going to happen is we're going to start to create these yellow and aqua products and the yellow products are essentially the hydration products that are forming. This is our calcium silicate hydrate, our monosulfate, our Portlandite. This is what's forming in the system as a part of reaction and the blue part is essentially the gel pores that are forming inside of our CSH. So now what we've been able to do is we've really started to, to be able to break the system up into a different set of components. We started out with just cement, water, and over time now we're going to see that we're going to have unreacted products, which are shown here in black. We're going to have reacted products shown here in yellow. We're going to have essentially water being shown inside of pores, which are this aqua color and the blue color. And the big difference between the pores that are aqua and the pores that are blue is simply the size of the pores. The aqua pores are very, very small. They're on the scale of, they're on the nanoscale, we're talking a few nanometers, where we start to talk about the aqua pores, these are our larger pores, these are capillary pores inside of the system, where they're going to go from that nanometer range up, up into the millimeter range. We also have a small amount of porosity that's generated in the system due to the fact that the, the reactants are actually taking up less, uh, the reacted product is taking up less space than the individual constituent materials. And this is known as chemical shrinkage. So as we look at this overall plot, what we can really start to do is we can really start to break this down. And what we can start to do is we can say that we had unhydrated cement when we started, we've produced solid materials, and we've actually have water or porosity remaining in the system. All right. And if we look at this on our right-hand side, what we can see is 
The bottom portion of this graph, what's shown in gray, these are the solid phases, and we're not going to worry about those too much for the rest of uh, today's talk. The next portion that we have is really the pace portion, and this pace portion is, is in the pace portion, we're really looking at the porosity that's being generated here. So the gel water, as I mentioned, is the small pores. The capillary water is the large pores. The chemical shrinkage is a little bit larger pore that's developing in the overall system. So we have the solid phase, which is shown here in gray, and we have the pores, which are shown here in this orangish color. But in addition to this, we have the air, which is, again, a porosity that can be considered to be part of the paste phase. And when we start to look at these proportions, what we see is the amount of air that's in this system is relatively large compared to the remaining porosity that's inside of our overall concrete. So while, you know, we mentioned a little bit earlier that the air is going to be about 20% of the paste, and we can see that over here that the air is about 20% of the paste, it makes up a relatively large portion of the pores that are inside of our concrete. If we take this a step further and we think about our pore space a little bit more, right, I want to take a look and start to actually put this into a real uh, concrete mixture that's a slip form paving concrete mixture. It's a 0.42 water to cement ratio. And what we did was we simply measured the, uh, the way that the water leaves the system, which is shown here in this bluish color. And you can actually start to relate the degree of saturation, the relative humidity, and the size of the pores that are being emptied. So the most important part of this as we start to look at this, if we look at the overall pores that we have, we have gel pores, which are our tiny pores. We have capillary pores and, and chemical shrinkage pores. These were the two that we were talking about that are kind of leftover space from water or mixing. We have the entrained air voids, which we see in this system. And the basic idea is we have the largest pores listed on the top and the smallest pores listed on the bottom. Right, so we go big to small as we go down this chart. Now, one of the fundamental laws of physics is water wants to leave the biggest pores first. So if the system was 100% saturated, we filled up all of the porosity with water, what we would see is that initially the water is going to leave the entrained air voids very, very quickly. It's then going to leave the chemical shrinkage voids. And then by the time we get to maybe 96 or 97% relative humidity, we've emptied out all of the entrained air, we've emptied out all of the chemical shrinkage pores, and we're really starting to work on emptying out the capillary pores. We continue to empty the pores until we get up to about 80% uh, relative humidity, where at that point now we really start to empty out the smallest of these pores, where we're starting to empty out the gel water. The thing that's really, really crucial about this, though, and the thing that's the most crucial as we think about this is the relative proportion of each of these pores that are inside of our concrete. So initially, we've got about a third of the system being gel pores in a well-hydrated paving concrete. We have about a third of the system being capillary porosity, or in that relative range, maybe capillary porosity and chemical shrinkage, and about a third of the overall porosity being in trained air. And the really important next question we have, right, is as we've developed this plot, I said, what if we started out with the pores being filled with water? The real question, though, is are, what are the pores actually filled with, right? And to draw an analogy, we could say, you know, well, there's lots of different donuts that are out there, but donuts can be filled with different things. Pores can be filled with different things. So if we're looking at the typical paste pores, these would be our gel and our capillary pores, right? These, for most concretes, are starting out being a filled donut. They're not filled with something exciting like chocolate or jelly or a custard. They're being filled with water. So it's water-filled porosity. So the general way to think about this is our paste pores are generally fluid-filled or water-filled, and they start out that way inside of our concrete. In contrast, our air entrainment or our air-filled pores, right, start out like this great glazed donut where the pores start out not being filled with a fluid, but they start out being filled with a gas or a vapor. So not surprisingly, the air voids are actually filled with air, 
right, much like this glazed donut. So if we go back and we sort of put this into context with the plot that we previously saw, what we would say is that when our concrete, right, starts to harden and starts to, uh, starts to move from a gelatinous material into a solid material, the degree of saturation in our concrete, even if we've had really great curing, we're only about 65 or 70 percent saturated. And the reason for this is we essentially have our gel pores and our capillary pores filled. Depending upon whether we've water cured or not, we may fill in these gel pores. But about a third of the overall porosity of our concrete is not filled in with a fluid. It's essentially empty porosity. It's air voids inside of the system. And these air voids being filled with air and not being filled with a fluid are going to be crucial to making our concrete uh, freeze-thaw resistant. So based on this concept, right, there have been several different freeze-thaw models that have been developed over time to start to try to explain how one could predict the service life of concrete in a freeze-thaw environment. And these models started really in the 40s and 50s, but a person who really pioneered a lot of work on this was, uh, was Fagerlund, who did a lot of work between the 70s and the, and the 90s, really starting to push forward on this concept of something called a critical saturation model. And the idea behind this is essentially that the concrete becomes damaged but it only becomes damaged after water is absorbed, it reaches a critical level of saturation, and then it also freezes. So the basic idea behind this model is that you have to absorb fluid, right, which is our first, uh, our first circle here. So you have to have water that goes into the system. You have to reach a critical level of saturation. It's not 100%, and we'll see what some of these numbers are in a few seconds. And then you have to have freezing. And the idea behind this is if you get all three of these things happening, then all of a sudden now you're going to be able to create freeze-thaw damage. Okay. So the basic premise of this concept is we can now start to model this by relating how fast water is absorbed into the system, how fast fluids are absorbed, and how fast they reach critical saturation to the service life of these concretes. So as we started to work and started to try to push this, uh, push a little further on this, what we started to do is we started to say, can we really start to define what this critical saturation level is inside of a concrete? A lot of the work that Fagerlund had done showed that the value could be, maybe he, he showed some measurements as low as 78%. In theory, if it, we just had hydraulic pressure, this would go up to something like 91%. So the basic idea is there's a critical level of saturation. And if you're below that critical level of saturation, so temporarily let's just draw a line at 85% saturation. If you're below this value, you can freeze your concrete and the stiffness or the elastic modulus doesn't change at all the more you freeze and thaw your concrete, as long as you're below that critical level of saturation. However, this theory says that when you're above this critical level of saturation, all of a sudden you start to see a decrease in the stiffness of the concrete. You start to see the concrete breaking down during freezing and thawing cycles. And here you can see some pictures of mortars. Now the important thing is these mortars have only been exposed to five freeze-thaw cycles, and all of a sudden you can start to see these enormous cracks that are forming in the system. Right? You'll see damage after even the first crack that starts to form. So the other thing that's really interesting when you start to look at this model is what we see are, what we see are two concretes with two completely different air contents. The red line and the red points represent a concrete with a relatively low air content that would typically be assumed to be not acceptable at all from a specification perspective and the green being a concrete with a relatively high air content. So it's 8% by, uh, by volume of overall content, which would be 31% of the paste being filled with air. And remember we said that the, the, the difference between kind of good quality air systems is about 18% of the paste, right? So we've got one that's below that and one that's above that. But when you look at the overall behavior, what we see is the behavior really falls into a very, very similar envelope here, which says that 
When you're below the critical level of saturation, there's no damage. When you're above the critical level of saturation, it really doesn't matter if you have good air or bad air or lots of air or little air, but once you're above that critical level of saturation, now all of a sudden your concrete can start to be damaged as soon as it starts freezing. And this again is the whole basis for what we're going to talk about. Now in a lot of the uh, rest of the discussion, I will just simply pick a single number. But what I wanted to just point out is that we can actually track the rate or the speed at which the damage is propagating in concrete to the degree of saturation. So concrete that is more saturated, reaching 100% saturation, has a faster rate of damage, has faster crack propagation, will be damaged more rapidly under a fewer number of freeze-thaw cycles than a concrete that might be closer to that critical level of saturation. Uh, and you can see here that there's a general trend that's frequently assumed to be linear between kind of this critical degree of saturation value and then some value that's maximum once you get to 100% saturation. Now, a lot of people will say, well, that's, that's interesting, but what is this critical level of saturation? And as I mentioned before, Fagerlin really showed that about the lowest number they would ever measure was in this 76 to 78% degree of saturation. The highest number based on theory, if you just had hydraulic pressure, is around 91%. And what you see here is all of the data starts to fall into this band really between those two levels, where you're starting to see these blue dots being, you know, here's that 85% that I mentioned that's kind of a good rule of thumb. And if you have a high air content, you're above that value, maybe it's 86 or 87%. When you have a low air content, you start to fall to lower critical levels of saturation. And the question here is, why would the critical level of saturation change? And one of the things that, it, that we know that this is based on is this is based on the spacing of the air voids. So here I've shown this in terms of the total air content, saying that when you have a higher total air content, you have a higher critical level of saturation up to a point, and then when you get to a lower air content, that value drops but it's really related to the spacing factor of the air voids. So what we might be able to do is we could take this data and we could redraw this and we could say if you have a better air void spacing, smaller distance between those air voids, you would see a higher critical degree of saturation. And some of the work that's been ongoing right now, especially work at uh, Oklahoma State, for example, has shown that you could use the SAM number and you can say that the SAM number, which is essentially a measure of the quality of the air void system, that is really related to the critical degree of saturation. When you've got a poor SAM number, a number that gets up above 0.25 or above 0.3, you see that that critical degree of saturation really starts to drop to maybe 75 or 80 percent. When you have a very good air void spacing, very low SAM number, you see that that goes up to a much higher volume. So for the rest of the discussion, I'm going to essentially say, let's assume that our critical degree of saturation is about 85%, but what we're really recommending for people who are specifying this is that we have some sort of a function that incorporates the concept of air void spacing in, into that function. Whether it's the air content that accounts for this in kind of a semi-direct way, whether it's the SAM number, whether you use a uh, point counting method to get the air void uh, spacing more directly, uh, that would be what we would re be recommending. But let's assume for right now that you have a critical level of saturation at 85%. Well, that takes care of the first portion of this curve and takes care of the, four, the first of these three things that we have to look at. And it really starts to say that if we looked at the water that's being absorbed in the system, right, the mass of the water that's being absorbed is a function of time, any time we get above this critical level, any time we get above this certain value, we can expect our concrete to become damaged. So if we're down in this range, our concrete is good and it's going to have a very, very long service life. If we get up into here, we expect that our concrete will have some overall damage into the system. And again, remember we said that we're picking this value to be about 0.85 or 85 percent, which works for a large number of the concretes that we're actually, uh, we're actually testing. Now, the second thing that we have to have is we have to get to a freezing temperature, all right? Now, when the concrete can't become damaged if the water doesn't start to freeze inside of the system. 
And the thing that's really important when we start to, to think about this is it's really important that we remember that all of the fluid inside of the concrete is not necessarily water, so it doesn't necessarily freeze all at zero degrees when you get to zero degrees or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. What happens is you have to actually get to a lower temperature than that, typically somewhere around five or seven degrees, to start seeing a substantial amount of the water freezing, and this is because of undercooling effects. So it takes a little while to nucleate the ice into the system. The water is also not pure water. It's a fluid that contains some electrolytes, which decreases the freezing point a little bit. But even when we do that, by the time we, our concrete gets to about minus 20 degrees, Really what we've done is we've frozen the water that's in those biggest pores. We're not freezing the water inside of the gel pores. That's going to take dropping the temperature even more. What we are doing is we're freezing any water that's in the biggest pores. If it's in the capillary voids, if it's in the chemical shrinkage, if it's in the air and train voids, this is really the water that's freezing. So the important thing to remember, again, is the big voids will we'll lose water first, but they're the first voids that freeze because it's easiest for the ice to form in those voids. Now, again, remember back to our discussion a little bit earlier where we really started to say, what is the degree of saturation? And I said, you know, we, let's think about the fact that we're about 70% saturated in our fresh concretes. Well, this depends on our mixture composition. So as we vary the water to cement ratio, not surprisingly, as we increase the amount of water in our concrete, we see that this degree of saturation starts to rise. We have more water in the system, and our initial degree of saturation rises, and we see that all of our curves have a trend here that says as the water to cement ratio goes up, our initial degree of saturation goes up. As we change our air content, as we go from a relatively low air content being 2% to a relatively high air content of being 8%, we see our initial degree of saturation decreases. This isn't surprising because what we're doing is we're increasing the proportion of the air voids inside of the system. So for the system we were looking at before, our 6% air content with a 0.42 water to cement ratio, we're right here around 60 or 65% like we've mentioned before, right? But if we start to see that our air content in our mixture drop, what we see is we drop down or we increase to an initial degree of saturation that's a much higher value. Maybe we move from 60% to 80% saturation as the air content changes from 6% to 2% air in the system. And again, Remember that this is crucial because once you get to this 85% value and you hit critical saturation, this is where our concrete is going to start to damage, become damaged. So when we have a good air content and our initial air is low in our system, our initial air content is 6% in our system, our initial degree of saturation is going to be low and our concrete is going to be a long way from being near this critical threshold where freeze-thaw damage can start to form. However, as we start to see the water to cement ratio rise and we start to see our air contents diminish, we get closer and closer to that line. Now, if we start to look at really the, the critical time-dependent portion of this, we see that we're going to have to look at how fast the fluid is absorbed into the pores of our concrete. And I'm going to talk here a little bit about just tracking how that water moves into our system. But I think the thing that's really important to remember is water can be absorbed into concrete very, very quickly if the pores are very small. So here we see a relatively dry concrete. We see it's placed in contact with a water solution. And after only 10 minutes, you can see that this water has moved to a front that's maybe five millimeters or a quarter inch inside of our concrete. After about 11 hours, what we can see is this waterfront has moved about two inches or 50 millimeters into our concrete. So we see that water moves very, very quickly if we compare this to something like ionic diffusion or other transport mechanisms. This is a really fast measurement.
And this is not unlike a paper towel sucking up water. It's the same type of concept. It's the same type of physics. Water wants to be inside of those very small pores, and water is actually drawn into those pores by something called a capillary force, which is relatively high for a small pore. Now, ASTM has test methods that actually examine how quickly water can be absorbed by the concrete, but there's a bit of a challenge with the ASTM test method. The basic idea behind this is you cut a hockey puck of concrete. It's about two inches tall. It's about four inches in diameter. And you condition this specimen so that some of its pores are dried. Now, the interesting part about this is depending upon how you condition this, you're going to change the height of this initial water-absorbed curve. And this makes a lot of sense. If you dry your concrete out more, more water is going to be absorbed into your concrete. So as soon as you place your specimen into contact with water, right, remember our concrete is acting like a paper towel or it's acting to absorb that fluid, and what we see is a rapid mass change in our sample. After only a few days, in this case it happens to be about two days, uh, one and a half or two days, we see that there's a massive change in the rate at which water is going into the system. Right? I will get to that in a, in a second, but the second thing that I want to show here is, again, remember we had our concrete with a good air system and we had our bad air system, right? We said that we had low air with this red, uh, red data and we had a relatively high air content shown here with our green data. If we just look at the mass of the water that's being absorbed, there is very different, little difference between these two mixtures. There's very little difference in terms of the amount of water that's being absorbed into the system. However, that is not the full or complete story. If we look at our concretes, and this is the exact same data that I was just showing, instead of looking at mass, which we've shown over here, if we look at how saturated our pores are, the degree of saturation, we get a very different picture starting to emerge. We see that while the mass, the rate of mass gain was very similar, they're getting the very different levels of saturation. Our concrete that had a good, high quality air void system is a much lower degree of saturation after two or three days than our concrete with a low quality air void system. And remember, our key issue here is how long does it take to get to about 85% saturation? So what you'll see here is this red line with our poor quality air void system, it's going to get to 85 or 88 percent after a relatively short period of time. This is on the order of days or weeks, right? However, our concrete that's got a much higher air content is going to take a much longer time and we're going to have to go way off the screen until it reaches 85 percent and this is going to take several years. So the real benefit of the air voids in the system is that they're decreasing the initial degree of saturation of our concrete. And by decreasing the initial degree of saturation, they're going to give us a much longer time for that water to be absorbed. So let's take a second and see why that's really the case. Well, what, as I mentioned before, we have this case where we're tracking the water that's going into the system, but let's really look at where that water is going. So if we see this picture on, on the top, we have really three different size pores being illustrated. We have really, really tiny pores, which are our gel pores, which are inside that area that I just circled. We have capillary voids, which are shown here as the, this, this particular pore that I just drew a box around. And we have these great big fat fellows up here. These are these uh, air voids uh, that we have in the system. So the big ones are the air voids. The little tiny ones that are too small to see are the gel voids, and then we've got the capillary voids shown here. If we introduce water from the left-hand side of the screen, what we'll notice is initially we see that water going in very rapidly, and this corresponds to exactly what we saw in the degree of saturation curves. As we move from image one to image two, we see that the mass of our sample is going to go up dramatically. We're going to see an increase in the degree of saturation. But what's really happening in this initial phase is this water front is moving further to the right-hand side. Now, the interesting thing is once we hit this point where this curve is going to change pretty dramatically, 
what's happened is the waterfront has really reached the other side of the sample. So this change in behavior is really more geometry dependent than it is a true material uh, type of interpretation. But what's happening is when we're on this initial slope, we're filling in the gel in the capillary voids. We're filling in the voids that are left over from the water to cement ratio of the system, that extra water that was in the system. As we start to see that kink in the curve, you'll hear people refer to this as the nick point or matrix saturation. What's really happening here is we're changing from filling in the gel in the capillary pores, which is what we saw in the blue portion of this curve, to now we're starting to fill in the air voids. And when we start to fill in the air voids, we're on a very, very different time scale. So one thing that I didn't mention is I didn't mention that this axis is the square root of time, but this is all happening very fast when we're filling in the gel and capillary pores. And once we start to fill in the air voids, we're starting to talk about a process that's going to take months and years for this to happen. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion going on on how do we measure this rate of water absorption very quickly. And as I mentioned, ASTM has a procedure where we can essentially condition concretes, we can place them into fluid, we can measure the mass. That really needs to be corrected to account for the degree of saturation. But we believe there's actually a faster way that you can go about doing this measurement that could actually be brought into everyday, um, everyday quality control. And the idea here is to use something called the formation factor. And the formation factor is measured from electrical resistivity. It's measured on your concrete in a matter of about 30 seconds. You hold a probe on the side of the sample, you get a resistivity. And then if you calculate for the, the conductivity of the pore solution, you can convert that over to something called the formation factor. I'm going to discuss this in a, in a couple seconds as it relates to chloride transport, which is where a lot of people have been using it. But it really relates to any transport property. What we can do, though, is we can relate the mass of the water that's being absorbed to the formation factor, and we can develop an equation based on first principle. This is simply the mass that's being absorbed in the sample. It's related to the square root of time, as we saw in the previous plot. There's a bunch of stuff in the front part of this equation, and this stuff accounts for the geometry of the sample, the density of the water, the radius of the sample, the capillary pressure, which is the size of the pores, and really the viscosity of the fluid. The critical issue here, though, is this rate of mass absorption is related to the inverse of the square root of the formation factor. So what we've shown is from first principles, we can actually relate the mass to the formation factor, and the formation factor is a much faster test that could be used uh, in daily quality control. If we relate, for example, the rate of sorption to 1 over the square root of formation factor for concretes with four different water to cement ratios going from a 0.3 to a 0.6, what we see here is a very, very linear relationship. So what we can actually do now is we can say we can relate the absorption or the sorptivity of our concrete to how the sample was conditioned. This blue line is an oven dried sample, the red line is a sample at 50% relative humidity. We can relate this to the way the sample is conditioned, but we can also relate this to the formation factor, which has great, great power. So the idea behind this is we can now start to put this together into a model. And the basic idea is we can essentially say we have water that's being absorbed in the big pores, these gel pores and these capillary pores, it's going to be absorbed into those pores so fast that we get to the nick point in just a day or two. And what we're going to essentially say is that happens so fast we don't even need to worry about that in our model. We're going to be able to calculate the nick point simply off of mixture proportions. So I showed this plot a little earlier, which was water to cement ratio versus the initial degree of saturation. And this is a calculation that's done simply based on the mixture proportions the degree of hydration and the density of the different materials. And just to show a little bit of how this, uh, this theoretical calculation corresponds to experiments, what we see here is a series of green line, uh, a series of data going from a concrete with an air content of 
to an air content of around six or six and a half percent. And what we see here is the theory matches uh, very, very well with the experimental data. So this would tell us that we can know our initial degree of saturation very quickly if we simply know our initial mixture design and what the air content was that we measured in our overall system. Right, what we really want to do now is we want to calculate the time that it takes to reach a critical level of saturation. And once we reach this critical value, that's really where our concrete is going to start to show signs of freeze-thaw damage. Now, we can actually go through and we can do this and we can write an equation that turns out to be a relatively simple equation that says the time of our con that our concrete is going to be uh, enduring is this critical level of saturation minus the saturation at the nick point divided by the rate at which the water is being absorbed and that whole thing is squared. So all of a sudden now we can start to see some of the key levers that are happening in our concrete. If we started out with our typical mixture design here shown in gray, again, we're not worried too much about what's happening in the first two or three days of our concrete where the water is being absorbed into the gel and capillary pores, but we see we go from our matrix saturation up to this critical level of saturation, and maybe we have a time of or service life of our concrete that's 15 years. If we increase the air content by a percent or two, we'll see that that may extend the life of our concrete out to by another five or six years, but if we decrease our air content, we see that that substantially can shorten the life of our concrete. Very simple concepts can take very practical things that happen in the field and can really start to explain the basic phenomena that we see every day with tests that can be performed very easily. Now, how does this, uh, this projection correlate to the, the types of performance that we've seen in our overall concrete? Well, again, if we have a higher amount of air in our system, we expect these concretes to perform relatively well. We see 20 or 25 year performance. We have low air content, not surprisingly, we expect to not have very good freestyle performance. We can do the exact same thing when we start to look at the SAM number, and we see again when we've got a good SAM number, which much like a golf score, a low SAM number is a good number, we see good long service lives, service lives. When we start to see poor air void spacing, we see that essentially we have a shorter time for our service life of our concrete. Now, the other thing that's been very important is this has been benchmarked against ASTM 666 testing. And much as we would expect, these concretes that are showing long service lives are showing good freestyle performance in the ASTM 666 test. These are showing very poor performance, failing after 80 or 120 cycles uh, in our overall system. So at this point, I want to introduce one other concept before I start to talk about other aspects of fluid transport. And what I want to mention here is that the time to critical saturation, as we've shown, is really related to the volume of our air in our system. If we go from 6% to 8%, we can see a shift in the time of our, the, the time our concrete is going to last. If we decrease the amount of air, we see a much shorter life to reach the time of critical saturation. However, one of the things that was really, really crucial when we started looking at this is the variability is very, very important. So having good process control is crucial to having long-lasting concrete. And if we think about this, you know, we have a plot that's shown here. Again, it's that same 0.42 water to cement ratio concrete, 6% air. It's a six-sack mix. We vary the fine aggregate in the system. As we start to move from a low variability concrete, which is shown here in blue, to a higher variability concrete, which is shown here in green, we see that the time of service life or time to reach freeze thaw damage can really start to, to change dramatically. These lines are drawn assuming that 20% of the concrete that's being placed would fail. And what we see is 20% of the concrete fails. We would see that at about 22 years for a, a low coefficient of variation, maybe a 5% variability in water to cement ratio and a 5% variability in air. However, if we start to see the air being more varied, maybe moving instead of moving from 5.5 to 6.5% like our typical specification shown in blue, 
to maybe moving from 3 to 9% where we really don't have good control of our air, what we're seeing here is we're moving from a service life of maybe 20 or 22 years down to a service life that may be something that's more like 13 years. So we're taking about a third of the life out of the concrete simply due to that variation that's happening in the overall system. Now, I want to take the last few minutes of this seminar and I want to talk a little bit about one other concept that I think has been neglected uh, pretty substantially as we discuss transport and corrosion. I believe that this is a crucial factor and I think that this will explain why we see a lot of variability in a lot of our time to corrosion predictions. I think there's a huge benefit for industry if we can examine this and understand this a little bit more closely. But I think one of the things, and, I, and this is why I think that we're not seeing this benefit, air has a substantial benefit on the service life from a chloride transport perspective that we are really not considering. So the basic idea here is we may have a bridge deck that's being built, we're going to place salts on top of this, and then we're going to try to measure the time it takes for those chlorides to start working their way through that bridge deck. Well, again, remember, a lot of times when we're running our transport tests, the, the standardized testing is telling us to vacuum saturate our concrete. When we vacuum saturate our concrete, we're filling in not only the gel pores and the capillary pores, but we're filling in the air voids as well. And this is not a state that we typically see in practice. In practice, we're frequently seeing that those air voids are not anywhere near being completely filled. So what this means is when we run our standard tests, for example, the rapid chloride penetrability test, or when we run some of our other tests, we're seeing that we're testing a concrete that is much more saturated than we would have in practice. Now the argument is frequently, well, it's easy to get there and everybody can get to the same condition. That's fine, but let's look at what happens when we actually look at the impact of that on some of the measured properties. So I mentioned this idea that we could get the formation factor, which is a measure of the pore structure of our concrete. It's one of the most fundamental measurements that we have. It's simply going to be the resistivity divided by the, resi the resistivity of the concrete shown on the top divided by the resistivity of the solution that's in the pores shown on the bottom. Now, a lot of people have focused in on this, but I think the most important thing is the real fundamental relationship is that the formation factor is one over the porosity, the volume of pores in our concrete, times the wiggliness of the pores, the connectivity, how connected those pores are. Now, if we start to look at this, what we've done here is we've measured the formation factor or you could think about this as the rapid chloride, the inverse of the rapid chloride permeability versus the air content. Now, these have exactly, each one of these different colors has exactly the same water to cement ratio, exactly the same matrix. And what you see is as the air content increases, we'll see that the RCBT or the formation factor can change by as much as about a third of the overall value. So one of the real questions is, why is RCBT so variable? Well, one of the reasons why our RCBT test is variable is because we're filling in the air voids and there's variability in the air voids in our overall system. Further, when we have a good quality air void system that we really need for freeze-thaw durability, we're actually hurting ourselves in terms of what we are getting for our measured transport properties. So this really is something that we haven't really substantially considered as an industry. If we essentially say let's not fill in the air voids, which is what's typically seen in practice, what we'll notice here is again that concrete becomes a relatively flat line where we're really measuring the transport properties of the paste. So again, here we have a high water to cement ratio, a medium water to cement ratio, a low water to cement ratio, but by not filling in the air voids, our measured resistivity, our measured formation factors are independent of the air content, which is very, very important. So what this means is we would now have an RCPT that is independent of the air void content. We would also be able to relate this back to things like actual apparent diffusion coefficients. 
So one of the things that we've really been working on of late is we've said, you know, we can actually use this very fast measure of the formation factor, and we can use computational modeling to predict the time at which our chlorides are getting into our concrete. So what we've actually done is we've coupled the formation factor with some simple binding, and what we can see now is a very fast measurement that can be done every day in terms of quality control can be used to predict chloride ingress, right? And this is much, much faster, and I would argue that it's almost as accurate as ASTM 1556 and is on stronger fundamental footing than 1556 in predicting the overall data that we see in terms of chloride ingress. So we know that there's going to be chlorides at the surface. We measure chlorides here shown experimentally as the, as the different points. And we see here that this prediction, based just on the formation factor and binding, does a very good job in predicting the overall performance. So in conclusion, I think really what we've seen is that the air is very important for our concrete. But what it's really important is it changes the level of saturation. And if we start to move towards this critical degree of saturation model, understanding air and understanding how fluid is transported and filled those air voids is really the key issue to the overall system. The second point I want to make is while air void spacing is important and you want to have really well distributed air voids, the critical issue to have from, from a first point is really what's the volume that you started with. The third point I want to say here is that the air, while we measure it in terms of the volume of our overall concrete, it's really best if we start relating that to the volume of the paste that's inside of the system. So if you have a system that's got lots of paste, you need to have a higher air content than a system that's going to be leaner and meaner and maybe a more green or sustainable concrete. You can get away with a lower air content in the overall system. Pore filling is really the key issue. The small pores fill in first, and as those air voids start to fill in, that can really be problematic from freeze thaw. But it also plays an impact on our transport properties. So we can see that when you fill in your air voids, you're going to decrease the formation factor by about a third, or you're going to see about 30% um, higher RCBT values. And this really starts to say we can start to learn a lot more about our materials if we start understanding how those samples are conditioned. And really, the air content is really helping to extend the time of corrosion, and we think that this can explain a lot of the variability that people are seeing in simple tests like the, the overall air content. And with that, I am happy to uh, take questions if we have time, Anne, or hear uh, other suggestions as we start to start to move this forward. So again, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Jason, thank you very much. We do have a few questions coming in. Just a reminder, folks, if you do have a question, uh, the Q&A function on your screen, if you just type it in there, um, I will read them off. So we do have one question, Jason. I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. What level of saturation uh, is being achieved in the C666 test? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and I would answer some is probably the best answer, because what's happening is ASTM 666 is really, it depends on how long, it depends on what your initial mixture proportions are and how long it's sitting in the, in the fluid, because what happens is you've coupled freezing together with absorption. So what we're trying to do in, in the models, we're saying those are two separate functions. You have water going into the system, and then you have freezing taking place. And in 666, if you take a sample that's been sealed and you throw it in, you start at that 65 or 66 percent, and that builds over time as water gets absorbed into the system and there's some impacts of thermal cycling but it really varies depending upon the air content and how long that sample has been, uh, been conditioning. Thank you. Next question, could you comment on the effect of different curing regimes on these aspects? Sure, so um, like anything else, the more you can cure your concrete, the better, because as you cure your concrete longer, what's gonna happen is you're gonna reduce that capillary porosity and you're going to increase the gel porosity. And you may say, well, why, why is that really beneficial? 
By increasing the gel porosity, you're increasing the small pores. And remember, those pores don't freeze until you get to maybe minus 30 or 40 degrees Celsius, which, which most of us aren't going to see. So you're, you're getting really two or three benefits by improving the length of curing. You're reducing your capillary porosity, and this is going to reduce the amount of freezable water. You're also going to reduce how easily that water is transported into the system. So you're going to really extend out that, um, the slope of that line. So by curing your concrete, uh, which we all know and we all want to do, we're going to get improved performance in our systems. Great, thank you. The next question is, are we only considering continued exposure to fluid and saturation? Have you thought about uh, absorption and desorption modeling? Yeah, so the absorption desorption has been considered, um, and what I would say is this is a uh, really active area of work. There's a way that you can bring that into the model. There's actually a factor that would account for the, you know, if you have more drying in a location than other places. Um, you can do both the absorption and desorption modeling. It just becomes much more computationally uh, and accounting intensive compared to the simple model that I showed that, that's a one-line type calculation. Great, thank you. What effect would use of a crystalline waterproofing admixture have on freeze thaw? So that, that's actually a really interesting question, you know, and I think this is actually um, one of the biggest uh, aspects that this type of approach really starts to open up. You know, if you, if you look at kind of classical um, concrete specifications that are freeze-thaw, they basically boil down to, you know, thou shalt have a water to cement ratio and thou shalt have a particular air content. If we start to say, um, you could put a waterproofing admixture or crystalline admixture or magic dust that doesn't allow your concrete to absorb water, you have really changed this equation in a very meaningful way. And all of a sudden now, you may be getting freeze-thaw resistance and reducing your degree of saturation in a very, very different way. Your concrete can't be damaged if it doesn't absorb water. So if you had a perfect admixture that didn't allow your concrete to absorb water, you would never have a freeze-thaw problem, right? You would always be below that critical level of saturation and your concrete would be completely fine. So, you know, I think what this is going to be doing is I think this type of approach opens up lots of other opportunities to, to do something to make our concrete freeze-thaw resistant rather than just say, thou shalt have air content. Great, thank you. Uh, those were our questions today. We do have time for one more if anyone uh, wants to type one in. I'll give that just a, a few seconds. Okay, seeing nothing come in, Jason, thank you very much for the presentation today, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. I uh, hope you'll join us again on a future webinar. Again, thanks thank you all for tuning in, and many thanks to MIT for hosting this. Thank you, Anne.